Hey guys and Chad there, my friends, and welcome to the I Give a Damn podcast, made possible by Fluorescein Media, the company behind ODs on Facebook. Today we are going to be talking all about glaucoma and ocular disease, and to discuss this with us we have none other than professor and researcher Dr. Jessica Steen. If you're unfamiliar with Dr. Steen, she is a professor at Nova Southeastern University, where she not only does research, but also teaches glaucoma and ocular pharmacology to her optometry students. In today's episode, we discuss the nuances of glaucoma management, including the learning curve that we go through as practitioners in terms of making a diagnosis and beginning treatment for glaucoma, to her own research in AI and applying AI to glaucoma management to improve our management decisions, and optimizing our treatment outcomes for future patients with glaucoma. In addition to these topics, we also touch on her passions for ocular disease, including the new treatments coming for macular degeneration. We even cover some of her backstory and passions into how she found the profession and became a researcher and an educator. I find Dr. Steen truly an amazing speaker, presenter, and educator, so please hit that subscribe and follow button, and here we go with Dr. Dr. Jessica Steen. Jessica, thank you for being here. Um, now, just you, we've been getting to know each other a little bit, but you're originally from Canada, right? And, and uh, Saskatchewan, am I saying that right? You say that very well. Okay. <laughs> very well. So Saskatchewan is certainly not the first place that people think about when they hear that someone is from Canada. North of North Dakota, Montana, really the middle of the country. And, and then how did you, of all places, uh, one, what brought you to school for optometry? And then now that you're living in Florida, teaching in Florida, what's, how, what of a big jump for you? It's certainly a geographic difference. So I went to undergrad at the University of Regina and studied optometry at the University of Waterloo mm -hmm. and then had the opportunity to pursue a residency at Nova Southeastern University. And that was really the jump south. And I understood, I learned, I appreciated the profession in mm -hmm. South Florida and was provided the opportunity to stay. And it's now been an additional eight years after residency. Time certainly flies. What, like, what originally allured you to even, uh, of residency? Like, I'm curious, like, I, I, there is still a split and some students choose to go to residency, some don't. What, what drove you to do a residency in the first place? It was the opportunity, and that was actually something really early on in optometry school that I was fortunate to really start to learn about the opportunities that existed in the profession mm. and to know that there was additional opportunity after graduation to really enhance and excel in more of a, a focused, specialized area. That concept always really appealed to even an early optometry student. Yeah. So given that opportunity, it was certainly something that I jumped at the bit to be able to continue <laughs> with. And uh, certainly, I think it really has forged the early career that I've had so far. Right. And it's, and you certainly didn't stop there. You went on and now you're a fellow of the Academy. You're also a diplomat of the American Board of Optometry. You know, how many more accolades can you really push for, right? But you know, we have so many options within our profession and so many areas to really enhance, ultimately, patient care through mm -hmm. our own, really, enhancements and opportunities and really the continued pursuit uh, towards excellence. And... You know, I try to take advantage and really continue to push myself in any way that I can. And I have to give you some props. I think you're an amazing speaker. You're really gifted at that. Is that something that you've worked on? Is it something that you just naturally have had a gift for for years? My background was performing arts. Oh. I was a dancer growing up. Cool. And always that type of engagement was something that I really enjoyed. And being in our profession, I've really understood that there are different ways to give back, not only to our patients, but also to the community. And it's something that I've really, really found to be really rewarding in that way. Mm -hmm. I know you were kind of somewhat recently famously quoted in, I believe, a modern optometry article for saying something similar to that, uh, just by somehow, like, really your passions and interests outside of optometry end up opening doors within optometry. Uh, and you find that just through your experience with, through with performance experience, arts? Through really with people. And I think that engagement, which is something that, of course, you understand really very well, it are the connections that we make in our profession. And that can be directly to optometry or finding those interests that overlap 
outside of optometry, whether that is, you know, as where we are right now, thinking about uh, maybe a show that we're going to or a museum that we're going to visit. It's those types of passions that I think ultimately really continue to drive ourselves to be better in our profession of optometry as well. With um, since we're here in New York City for for our viewers and listeners who are watching right now, is there a, a performing arts or um, any sort of a show, Broadway show, something that one like? Do you have a favorite or something you would recommend? Well, my favorite museum is the Metropolitan oh. Museum of Art. It the more that you visit that museum, or I was just speaking to my mom about this, that the more that you visit that museum, I think the more surreal it becomes to really understand not only the pieces, but the pieces in context of time, the pieces mm. in context with each other through time, and to even start to think about how each piece came to be where it is sitting now. It's almost a fourth dimension to art and artistry and really is a, a remarkable, remarkable resource that exists in the city. Yeah, I personally love visiting art museums in general, looking at different types of art. I feel after like three, four hours, I start to, you almost lose some appreciation because you're just seeing one masterpiece after the other. Like your mind's being blown so many times. Eventually they're just like, yeah, I've seen, I've seen that, you know, I've seen something like that. It's not as good as this other guy's. And so you kind of wears off after a while, but it, it is incredible. Do you do any sort of physical art? Do you paint? Do you draw? Do you anything I, like that? I grew up painting. I still do periodically, certainly not as much as I would ever like to or love to or used to, but certainly something that those artistic sides okay. are, are, exist. Sure. And do, do you find uh, any of that comes out in your work? I know you, you do a lot with glaucoma. You kind of, that's kind of your, your specialty, isn't it? Do you... I think that's a really interesting point to bring up. When we're talking about glaucoma management, so much of it is pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, yes, of course, there is real hard data to interpret. But a lot of that data interpretation is a visual interpretation and more of the understanding, the qualitative understanding of how that data changes over time. So I really do think the artistic understanding or continued pursuit really plays a significant role in glaucoma management, but ocular disease evaluation, our profession as a whole as well. Right. I think one of the biggest things when I did my residency was as a student, I feel like you learn so much of like memorization. You almost I like to describe it as like I memorized Will's eye manual like a cookbook. Like I knew the basic recipe. But once I got into residency, oh my gosh, I'm not just seeing one case of cataracts. I'm seeing macular degeneration, cataracts, dry eye, some f past uveitis. I, I, I don't know what happened. It's not active now, but something was there. And then you're dealing with glaucoma, possibly glaucoma. What caused it? Was it the uveitis? Was it something? You know, there's so much. It's not just one recipe anymore. Those nuances to care, that's what makes it interesting. That's what makes it challenging, but that's what continues to drive us forward, certainly. Yeah. In your um, expertise with glaucoma, and since you're, man you're working with students, you're teaching students from the ground up, you're literally giving them their first course in glaucoma. Uh, I'm curious, first, where do you think if students struggle with something with glaucoma, what do they struggle in? I think it's that holistic experience that it's not black and white. Mm. It really is the shades of gray and how do you assess the person as a whole? It's not one data point. It's evaluating multiple data points and really performing a complete risk analysis, which when you are learning and you're understanding the anatomy and the physiology, applying those nuances without the direct clinical experience is something that's so difficult. Yeah, and that's uh, something I see. I try to explain that. I, I give my stu my externs a little bit of give, um, just knowing them, like knowing I'd been in that situation. It's like, look, I know you know the obvious textbook answer, and you're learning the gray areas, you know, but I, I try to try to push in that direction as well. And that's what's so important about education and glaucoma education is that it's not just, you know, a six week period in a course in a classroom. It really is is an experience that starts in the classroom, continues in the early clinical experiences, mm -hmm. and then continues to develop through your fourth year residency or in clinical practice. And I imagine it's in an academic setting, maybe where you're at, depending on your clientele, like who's coming back? Like who's really 
going to be coming back for a follow-up versus his true loss to follow-up. I think making... I, that That's honestly something that I will never forget is when I had to make that decision as a resident. Like, oh, I don't have anyone like really above me to tell me to treat Glux, to start treating glaucoma to the point where it's like, no, I know we need to treat glaucoma. And if I say no, if I don't, if I say, oh, we'll wait, it's like I'm being negligent at this point. And so I think that was that, honestly, one of those tur key turn turnkey moments where I felt like, I really stepped from being just a student to really being a doctor is making that decision. And being independent at, at, at early on, but really continuing that process that you're describing, mm -hmm. I think is so, is so important is that it's not a flip that's ever switched. It's that continuous learning, especially early on in your career. Who are the patients that you're most worried about? Who are the patients that you feel more comfortable watching? Mm -hmm. Who are the patients that you're going to maybe visit more frequently or have visit more frequently? And then of course, who are those patients that you are going to start on treatment? And that, that process, that understanding is something that really does take good quality training, right. but certainly takes the experience and, and the real experience for yourself in understanding that as well. With, uh, with all of your experience, the teachings, and just knowing where other professionals at, do you think, because with glaucoma, right, old school glaucoma management fields, optic nerve eval, optic nerve head photo, even before OCT existed, now there's so many extra things, whether it be coronal history says you're doing not just pachymetry and gonio and OCTs. And what is there one test you think is like the most valuable? And is there one that's maybe you would say is the most overrated? Well, I think in a time where we have access to so many incredible technologies, the most valuable goes back to our clinical evaluation. It truly is your clinical evaluation of the optic nerve through a, ideally a dilated pupil at the slit lamp. That is where your suspicious of glaucoma, suspicion of glaucoma really starts from. Mm -hmm. So that is the most valuable. You know, when we talk about additional technologies, certainly they all have or all impact the risk assessment. So certainly objective evaluation of the retinal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell layer or complex is so valuable. But certainly I think it just stems back to a good quality optic nerve assessment in with the stereoscopic view. Yeah, I think uh, we always, always we're always at that risk of falling on technology, relying so heavily on it. Uh, and I think that's just the scary part of our nature, even with cell phones and things like that. Like, what would happen if we lost that technology, you know, tomorrow and we just had to restart? Like, you have no idea what you'd be doing. Um, like, how many people are just not going to be able to do math because they're just used to always having a calculator with them, right? I can't even remember most of my friends' personal phone numbers. I just have them all on my phone. So I think definitely in the realm, because I think we do hit that moment. I have a patient who's, she's like 92, and she has had glaucoma for years. Her, she's pressures are 10, consistently 10, but she is in such frail condition, she cannot do an OCT. She can't even sit. She, she's got too much lumbardosis in her spine. She can't get up to the OCT, unless there was a, somehow a handheld one, maybe. But she, uh, she can't do a field. She just can't. So it's like, really, we're managing off of optic nerve head evaluation and IOP. And... And in those cases, it, it's the understanding of meeting the patient where they are, that mm -hmm. we do absolutely the best that we can in every clinical environment and every clinical experience. And that really is a purely clinical evaluation and experience. Ultimately, you know, when you're thinking about our older individuals, it's that balance and, and just trying to optimize and maximize that person's quality of life. Hey, I just want to take a quick pause and give a shout out to Fluorescein Media. Not only do they make this podcast possible, but they are the company behind the social media community, ODs on Facebook, which is the longest running optometric community with the most active discussions amongst over 46,000 eye care professionals. So if you're not already a member, don't miss out and join the discussion over on ODs on Facebook. Otherwise, let's get back to it. Now you mentioned, uh, since we're talking about 
technology and kind of this advanced. Now you are in this amazing position where you're also can doing some research. You're involved. You're involved with it. Are you the head of doing some research? So I'm I'm part of a team that is primarily a computer science driven team that we're really interested in machine learning and deep learning applications within the diagnosis of glaucoma and ultimately, ideally, the prediction of development of glaucoma as well. So it really is a computer science-based team where I, I and one other actual fourth-year student of ours are really driving the clinical or the medical side of that team. What is uh, What does that look like from your perspective? Like, what do you... What are you putting together? Do you really have like an AI bot at this point? Do you guys have, is the machine, do you, is it fairly reliable? I'm, I'm curious, I have no idea. So what we're most interested in at this point is being able to increase the accessibility of these large data sets that exist for other AI researchers to utilize. So right now there's, of course, the term AI and talking about artificial intelligence has become such a buzzword. And there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of curiosity, but what I find is that sometimes there isn't as much meat behind it and real scientific data and support behind it. So what we're finding is when we look at these publicly available training data sets that research groups are using to train models for detection of glaucoma, let's say from a fundus image. What we're most interested in is kind of optimizing those data sets for other research groups to be able to use them in an effective way and evaluate the quality of those data sets. That that makes sense because even if somebody does, let's say, build an AI, if it's built on faulty knowledge, if it's built on a bad data set, then how good really is the AI at at really learning and improving or making decisions? So, I mean, it, it, the classic example is maybe some of the most basic OCTs that came out were based on what? A population of how many of thousands of people, but of the same race, gender, you know, so how your normative database is based off of what? <laughs> right. So it's the applicability of these models. And I think that's the really exciting thing in thinking about where we are as a profession, as a society, mm. moving with artificial intelligence applications and really many things, many pieces of technology that we currently use, is to try to remove some of the biases that we know exist in these systems and to ensure that these models are really equitable models and applicable models, not just to one person, but to each individual person. Where do you think uh, ultimately five, ten years from now, now, where do you think this this technology, and specifically glaucoma, where do you think it's going to head? Where, where do you see it? Well, we're at a time where we have so many different data points that we're clinically interpreting at each visit. And, you know, at what level do we reach that tipping point to say that this is not something that we as the managing optometric physician can truly manage, interpret, and then apply to the patient's care in that short, isolated visit? So where I think think this is going to be most applicable is to have some help in interpreting the data that we have, whether those are OCT scans, whether it's incorporation of evaluating central corneal thickness, hysteresis in context with the OCT scan to maybe give us a little bit of a marker to say, this might be a red flag patient. This might be a patient that you may wish to extend your evaluation interval. So kind of that data interpretation side that then we incorporate and leads us to more of a role in counseling and understanding what we do with that data in an individual patient circumstance. Sure, like the low versus high risk patient, you know, do you need to see them, I don't know, three more months? Do I need to see them maybe to six months, you know, making those decisions? And ultimately then that's leading into predictions. So who are those patients that are most at risk of developing disease long-term and what Mm. might that look like? Those are the things that we do in a clinical environment already, but we know that we can do it better. And I think having additional help to kind of guide us will ultimately then allow us to spend more time with the patient and right. talk to the patient about that risk and what we are going to do to either mediate, moderate, or just continue to assess that risk over time. And I know uh, a lot of 
it's very easy, I think, just human nature to think about these technologies, right? If in general, people don't know much about AI, they can think of your brain goes to the worlds of movies like Terminator, just like, oh my God, this is going to destroy the world. But I know there is professionals uh, in our own space who are worried, like, we're going to put ourselves out of a job in some way, right? If we're automating everything. But I imagine that that thought, this is before my time, but even auto refractors, I imagine people had the same concern when those first came out. So that's a great analogy. I think that it ultimately will provide us as the optometric physician with more time doing the types of patient care that we really want to be doing and spending more time with that patient, which ultimately makes us and makes our patients value, value you know, what we provide as far as the patient experience even more than where we are right now. And probably better outcomes for sure, because if, uh, if we have this sort of technology, not only will we be determining risk better, but we'll probably be detecting pre-parametric glaucoma a lot earlier as well. And so then we can initiate better treatments that way. Early detection, optimizing treatment. So that's the other question is, what is the best treatment mm. for this particular patient? And, you know, with glaucoma, of course, we're, we're thinking about not just the short-term process, but we're thinking about this patient through their lifetime. So that's what I think makes glaucoma such a unique disease state for continued development is we're diagnosing disease at the age of 55. This patient may have 50 more years to go. Mm -hmm. So we're concerned about that process throughout the patient's life, not just in the next year or two. What's your, um, like right now, I don't know what the state of Florida is like, but since you're teaching, do you guys teach uh, like SLT, anything in those forms of lasers beyond just our, our normal like pharmacological range? So as far as treatment of, of disease states in general, absolutely. Nova Southeastern University really prepares students to be able to practice at the highest level of the profession awesome. in any state that they choose to do that yeah, with. That makes me happy always to hear that. Too. It's, it's remarkable. And to see the understanding, not just the excitement, but the true appreciation for what that holistic treatment really means is is really remarkable in our students. What's your opinion on, um, th there's a couple different papers that are out there that at least uh, that um, hint to recommend that maybe using laser as a first line treatment versus um, pharmacological therapy. I'm just interested in your personal professional opinion about that. Well, I think it's well established that SLT is a, is a very viable treatment mm -hmm. as a first line option for patients with primary open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension. I think one of the barriers is often the patient perception about what that treatment may be or may not be, or potentially some of the advantages or disadvantages versus a medically based therapy. And again, you know, that really ties into how well are we discussing treatment options with our patients and truly ensuring that our patients understand each option and therefore understanding which may be the best for them at a particular moment in their life. You're amazing at, uh, I, I just want to say again, you're amazing at even with this podcast interview, you, there's some people who have challenges with having conversations, but you you have you shine when you're you're able to speak and communicate. And so again, I just want to applaud you for that. Um, when it comes to like talking, uh, co-managing, do you you've had lots of mentors in your life? Um, and and uh, I think, in the realm of optometry, glaucoma is, at least when I was in school, I was told that glaucoma is probably the number one most liability stricken area for optometry. Like if, if optometrists are going to be in a, a lawsuit of some kind for malpractice, it's because they didn't treat early enough. So with practicing glaucoma as a, an optometrist who's so spearheaded in the realm of glaucoma, there are... Um, uh, glaucoma is a whole area that our profession had to really push that we can manage this, that we can manage this, we can really do this on our own, right? In some states, there's been a lot of oversight by uh, our OMD colleagues saying like, nope, you need our permission or you need our authority to sign off to, to manage this. Um, being that you work pretty closely with a lot of OMDs, what has your experience been? Do you find that that's kind of really a sentiment of the past? Do you find that OMDs are just uh, all very supportive and, and working well with optometry? 
Well, I think it ultimately comes down to how that patient is going to be able to access the best and the highest quality of care. Mm -hmm. And as primary care optometric physicians, managing glaucoma is certainly well within our wheelhouse, our training, and our expertise. And, you know, we've had certainly very, I've had very supportive mentors through my career and certainly still do. And it's been wonderful to be able to learn from them, to train with them, and then to really extend and to pass that along to our residents and our, our students currently. So I think it's really important to have really supportive mentors through the process that when you have questions about a difficult case, which always certainly still come up, yeah. having those colleagues to really share with and to work through those challenging cases really ultimately supports you to provide better care in the future as well. What do you um, what do you currently think of like MIGS procedures? Do you imagine imagine you can't really get by now without, oh geez, well they need cataract surgery. It's just becoming almost a standard in some ways. So for patients who have primary open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension, no question, anything that can be done at the time of cataract surgery to reduce that patient's need for chronic medical therapy afterwards is ultimately positive for that patient. So certainly there is a, an expanding and, and really the continued support of, of trying to manage a disease with fewer medications long term as well. Outside of just glaucoma, because you're so heavy in ocular disease in general, uh, what else are you working with or what other passions or interests do you have in well, within the retinal disease space, peripheral retinal pathology, I certainly have a personal interest in, and understanding therapeutic options for retinal disease is something that, you know, we've seen such incredible development in the last, never mind years, but now in the last month at this point. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's a really exciting time to be uh, managing retinal disease and co-managing retinal disease with yeah. our colleagues. No, there's so many different types of retinal disease we could talk about, whether it be diabetes, whatnot. Now, no, I think you're just timing wise being that February 2023 here, uh, Cypho I don't know how to say it still. Cyphovri, I think, rolls off the tongue is, nicely. Is what people are using. Okay. Um, for the injection for geographic atrophy. That was the first approval now that's FDA approved. Um, what's, uh, yeah, what's kind of your fascination with, uh, is it with all of retina disease? Is it purely AMD that you're most interested in? or Well, right now, geographic atrophy is the disease state, of course, that we are really interested in, that now there is a treatment to mm -hmm. try to slow the progression of geographic atrophy. Now, I think this is such a big step, not just for patients with geographic atrophy, but now thinking ahead. So if this same or a similar medication might be down the road investigated for earlier disease states, is there the potential to reduce or eliminate the development of late stage disease altogether? Thinking about earlier diagnosis, earlier treatment mm -hmm. to prevent vision loss later on. That's the that's really the meat of understanding uh, dry AMD at this point. And I think we're just at this very early, early entrance into understanding what may be possible down the road from this first step with Pigsetto Copeland's approval. Yeah. It just rolls off your tongue. So easy to say that. <laughs> the the generic name is Pigsetticoplan, Peg, Pigsetticoplan. Um, and now the other one that's currently under investigation, which works l further down the, the complement cascade and on five instead of complement factor three, right? The um, I think probably for myself, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, but I've always been so fascinated with our understanding of how inflammation plays a role in these diseases because um, it just it, there, because we know more like how inflammation is causing this progression within macular degeneration in diabetes, it makes it feel like oh we have a lot more control or say because we understand inflammation pretty well because I feel like a lot of it's like yeah. It, Geogra you know, geographic atrophy, it just, it happens. We don't know why. It's like, oh, now we're starting to crack the code in a way. And so I get more excited just the fact, oh, yeah, we're on to something. And so it tells me like that there's something down the future we're maybe be able to figure out more. Well, inflammation is so central to many systemic diseases, mm -hmm. never mind ocular disease. And certainly steroid therapy, systemic 
topical ocular injectable steroid therapy has, has mediated so many, uh, so many disease states. But then it's about the understanding of what particular inflammatory markers might be impacted or upregulated in a particular disease state. And then how can a treatment de be developed that targets that specific mediator. So, I mean, our colleagues in rheumatology, this is certainly an entire field focused on these subtle inflammatory mediators, but I really do uh, completely agree that we're starting to understand how central that is in retinal disease development and progression and understanding that there's a lot more from a complex standpoint that maybe we can find those simple or, or direct or focal uh, real treatment targets. Sure. And then especially because like this new medication is an injection, do you, I'm just curious, I, I'm still, there's some people I've spoken with who question if optometry will ever do injections. Um, and I'm curious, is like, do you think that's something you would see in our future of our profession? Do you think you'll be teaching? Do, do you guys at least even start talking about that in school? I we don't certainly know. don't discuss intravitreal injections. Yeah. I think that's something that we have as primary care providers, so many disease states and, and, and so many considerations and concerns that we're managing with patients. Certainly something that is an intravitreal procedure is not something that we're really discussing or concerned or worried about. Yeah. Uh, but when we do think about our retinal surgical colleagues and just managing the number of injections that they are performing, certainly there is the question that how is this demand going to be kept up with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, those are those are just always interesting thoughts. Because um, myself, it's like, gosh, I want to dive into this deeper. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know if I'm going to be doing this. I'm happy my retina specialist that, you know, Dr. Reynolds, who I work with, he's uh, he knows every small little study that's ever been done on these different medications he's doing. And I fully respect that. So I'm happy that he's doing it. Um, but I'm also really happy to play my part as soon as I have a patient who's got the early signs of GA. Now it's like, oh, well, now I'm going to have you sent on over and you get to get to meet our retina specialist and become good friends with him. So. And that conversation from our perspective, I think is so valuable and so valued by our patients also that now we get the time to spend with our patients to discuss treatment options. How about that in geographic mm -hmm. atrophy, not just low vision consultation, but a treatment option. Now, thinking about what that looks like through a patient's lifetime. Again, it's treatment of a chronic disease, not unlike glaucoma, that requires continued adherence to a particular injection schedule that, again, the goal is not to improve vision. The goal is not to reverse or stop the disease process, but it's to slow the disease process over time to continue to really maximize that visual quality of life. So geographic atrophy and the con uh, really the comparison to management of glaucoma, really there are many overlaps there. And we see the challenges that our patients have in adhering to long-term treatment in glaucoma therapy. And I think that will parallel what we see in geographic atrophy treatment also what do you um what now you're you're so into this and i love the fact that yeah you're you're a professor at a school you're you're doing research you're presenting ce what drives you on a personal level what drove you to optometry and what keeps you going what keeps you passionate when instead of just getting frustrated by like there's so much to do i think early on it was the excitement of a lot of the technology which for many of us who are technology driven, especially mm -hmm. as kids or as young adults, that was always a very interesting field to understand how we can apply technology to treat medical ocular conditions. Now through teaching, it's really our students, our residents, and ultimately our patients that really keep us going. Mm -hmm. No day is is, is really similar to any other day. It's always the continued challenges and the excitement and the really unpredictability of working with patients, students, and residents that keeps us going. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, for being here. Um, really can't say thank you enough. This has been great. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's always fun to spend time talking about the things that we love to do on a daily basis. So thank you.